Good morning, my dear students. Today I am continuing with the fourth part of the cerebellum, that is about the connections of the cerebellum. In the last class, we have seen about the cerebellar cortex and also the deep cerebellar nuclei, and what are all the different connections between the different types of neurons among the three layers of the cerebellar cortex, that is the molecular layer, Purkinje cell layer, and the granular cell layer. You have seen all these things. Now we are uh, talking in view of about the overall part of the connections of the cerebellum. What are all the efferents to the cerebellum and what are all the efferents from the cerebellum? Efferents means that which are coming towards the cerebellum. Efferents means that are going away from the cerebellum. So if you see what are all the efferents which are coming to the cerebellum that is from the cerebral cortex and from the spinal cord and via the vestibular nerve and along the via the red nucleus and the tectum. So if you see what are all the fibers which are coming to the cerebellum from the cortex that is the cerebral cortex. So they are the cortico ponto cerebellar pathway which are the cross fibers and number two it is the cortico olivo cerebellar pathway and the third one is the cortico reticular pathway. Okay, so these are all the three pathways. If you see here, the, the cerebro reticulo cerebellar pathway, it is an uncrossed pathway. Whereas the above two pathways, that is the cortico ponto cerebellar pathway and the cerebro olivo cerebellar pathway, these two are the crossed pathways. Okay, next what are all the fibers which are coming from the spinal cord? The name itself suggests they are the spino cerebellar tracts. So anterior spino cerebellar tract posterior spinocerebellar tract and the third one is the cuneocerebellar tract okay next the third one is the vestibular nerve and the fourth one is the red nucleus and the tectum these are all the efferent fibers which are going to the cerebellum next what are the all the fibers which are coming away from the cerebellum so they are called the efferent fibers what are all the efferent pathways they are the globose emboliform rubral pathway Number two, dentato thalamo pathway, and the other one is the fastigial vestibular pathway, and the other one is the fastigial reticular pathways. These are all the four pathways which are coming away from the cerebellum. Next, if you see, already we have uh, seen the efferents and the efferents which are going uh, towards the cerebellum and moving away from the cerebellum. They are forming three types of cerebellar peduncles. They are called the inferior cerebellar peduncle, middle cerebellar peduncle and the superior cerebellar peduncle. In this peduncles also we are having the efferents and also the efferents. What are all the efferents and the efferents in the inferior cerebellar peduncle? So the efferents are the posterior spino cerebellar tract, cuneo cerebellar tract, olivo cerebellar tract, vestibular cerebellar tract and the reticulo cerebellar tract and the fibers which are coming from the cranial nerve nuclei. These are all the efferents which are going to the going to the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay. Next, coming to the efferent pathways which are moving away from the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. They are the fastigio vestibular pathway, fastigio olivary pathway, and the fastigio reticular pathway. Okay. These are all the efferents and efferents of the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now coming to the middle cerebellar peduncle, here we can see the efferents, they are the cortico ponto cerebellar fibers and the other one is called the commissural fibers. Commissural fibers means connecting the same path on either side, that means on the right and the left side. If you see the cerebellar cortex, it is having commissural fibers coming from one side and they are going to the opposite side of the cerebellar cortex which is uh, together functioning as an unit, okay. So commissural fibers, they are coming from one side of the cerebellar cortex and going to the other side of the cerebellar cortex and together they are functioning as a unit, okay. And what are all the efferent fibers? They are nothing but one commissural fibers, okay. Next coming to the efferents and efferents of the superior cerebellar peduncle. So the efferents are anterior spino cerebellar tract, tecto cerebellar tract, rubro cerebellar tract, cortico ponto cerebellar tract. If you see all these names, they suggest themselves. Spino cerebellar tract from spinal cord to cerebellum, tecto cerebellar tract from tectum to cerebellum, rubro cerebellar fibers. That means from red nucleus to the cerebellum. 
Next, cortico ponto cerebellum. That means via cortex, via pons, and then we are going to the cerebellum. Cortico ponto cerebellar tract. And what are all the efferents which are going away from the cerebellum via the superior cerebellar peduncle? They are dentato rubral tract. That means from dentate nucleus and red nucleus. So dentato rubrothalamic tract, dentato rubrothalamo cortical tract, and dentato thalamo tract. And cerebello tectal tract, cerebello hypothalamic tract, and cerebello reticular tract. These are all the efferents which are moving away from the cerebellum via the superior cerebellar peduncle. So, we have seen the connections of the cerebellum, mainly the efferents and efferents, how it is being connected with the different parts of the um, brain and also to the periphery. And uh, we are uh, summarizing the functions of the cerebellum here as follows. They are, they play an important role, the cerebellum, it plays an important role in the control of the muscle tone and it also plays an important role in the control of voluntary activity. It also plays an important role in control of involuntary activity. Cerebellum plays a role in the control of equilibrium and it also plays an important role in learning, in learning. So now we are going in detail about the functions of the cerebellum how it is possible, how it is doing all these stuffs. If you see, what is the role of cerebellum in the muscle tone? We are having the gravity muscles and the anti-gravity muscles, yes or no? So in both upper limbs and lower limbs, we are having the gravity muscles and the anti-gravity muscles. So if you see the cerebellum, it is having efferent and different connections with the reticular formation and it uh, controls the muscle tone via the gamma motor neurons. In muscle spindle, you might have heard about this gamma motor neurons. They play a very important role here. And uh, they did some uh, researches in the experimental animals. When uh, the cerebellum, uh, in experimental animals, they found that the cerebellum is uh, having an inhibitory effect on the muscle tone. It is having an inhibitory effect on the muscle tone. That's why in case of experimental animals, when there is lesion of the cerebellum, it is producing spasticity. But if you see humans, it is little bit quite opposite. It is causing hypotonia. It is causing hypotonia. So, uh, and especially if you see the cerebellum, it is uh, maintaining the muscle tone via its uh, effect on the anti-gravity muscles. Okay. And uh, if you see here, it is having no effect on the activity on the smooth muscle. Okay, it is having no activity on the smooth muscles, only on the skeletal muscles it is having its activity. So, it is having uh, a uh, control over the involuntary motor activity via its efferent and different connections with the red nucleus, reticular formation, tectal nucleus, vestibular nucleus and olivary nucleus. So, it thus helps in the control of tone and posture and also the rate of firing is uh, controlled via the extrapyramidal tracts, extrapyramidal tracts. It also plays an important role in the reflex contractions and also the controlled, coordinated and uh, uh, precise movements which are produced via the cerebellum, by the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, it plays an important role in both control of voluntary activity and also the control of involuntary activity. If you see here, in case of lesions of cerebellum, we can see a pendular nature. Why there is a pendular nature? So there, uh, there is, a, what is the reason means? There is one, first of all, there is hypotonia because of the lesion in the cerebellum. And also there is absence of coordination and absence of breaking action. The, these are the things which are responsible for the pendular movement when there is any lesion of the cerebellum. Okay. Next, uh, coming to the control of voluntary motor activity. And if you see, um, the cortex, it is having uh, connections with the uh, cerebellum in a circuitry fashion. So the cortex and the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum, it is having connections in a circuitry fashion. And uh, this is uh, very much important. Suppose if a person is doing uh, any task or any movement, so when the movement is fast, so the error, it is being detected and uh, the cerebellum, it is sending the signals to the cerebral cortex such that the rate of firing of the cerebral cortex, it will be controlled such that we can produce a smooth and precise coordinated movement. 
So the connections between the cortex and the cerebellum thus plays an important role in producing or executing smooth, precise and coordinated movement. And uh, the cerebellum, it also plays an important role in the control of equilibrium via the vestibular apparatus. Already we have seen the vestibular apparatus like uh, in case of linear acceleration the utricle and the saccule it is uh, being operated in case of angular acceleration that is via in movement the semicircular canals they are uh, sending the information to the vestibular nucleus and from there the information is being sent to the floccular nodular lobe of the cerebellum and the cerebellum it inhibits the contraction of the antagonistic muscles already we have seen. Thus, it plays an important role in maintaining the posture and equilibrium. Okay. And uh, if you see how the cerebellum, it plays an important role in learning means. If you see any task, uh, if a child is a star, uh, walking for the first time in his life, the movement is not that much precise and smooth. There will be so many errors like that. But on continuous uh, walking, there will be having a smooth, executed and precise movement of the uh, baby. So this is possible. Okay, this is a learned task. Even if you are driving a cycle, it will be a little bit difficult for you to follow all in a correct manner or uh, driving a car like that. So first of all, there will be slowness. And gradually the links up and uh, uh, we can uh, produce a very performed and well learned task. So this is uh, cerebellum plays a very important role. And uh, if you see in the beginning of the learning of a task, you need all concentration and how you are doing and all. Once it becomes involuntary, then there is no need that uh, you are uh, operating an accelerator or a brake like that. Involuntary you can do all those things. So this is a learned task to, be, to say the best examples. And the cerebellum, it is uh, playing an important role with learned adjustments and makes coordination easier when a task is performed over and over. Okay. So, this that is how cerebellum is playing a very important role in maintaining the control of voluntary activity, involuntary activity and in the muscle tone, in the control of equilibrium and the posture and uh, all the things and in case of learning also. And if such a cerebellum, when it get is uh, damaged or it is having any lesions, what are all the disorders we can see with cerebellum are? So they are hypotonia or atonia. Hypotonia means decrease in the muscle tone. Atonia means there is loss of tone completely. Then we call it as atonia. Okay. And uh, there is asthenia. Asthenia means weakness. And um, there is ataxia also. That is the rate, range and direction of the movement, it is fragmented. Okay, this is not in perfect manner. And there is disequilibrium. When the equilibrium is not uh, maintained, we call it as disequilibrium. And there can be past pointing or dysmetria and overshooting to the one. Suppose if you see, when we are conducting cerebellar test, we will ask the subject to do finger nose test. That means we will stretch out the hand like this and we will ask him to touch like this. When a person is having cerebellar lesion, he cannot touch the tip of the nose directly, but instead he will move here, hither to hither, that's up and down and then he can touch. So this is called as dysmetria. They cannot assess the exactly the length and location of the subject. Suppose they are uh, we are giving any cup of coffee like that. Even uh, the old persons who are having some cerebellar damage or degeneration, they cannot exactly focus and they cannot handle. They will move hither and hither and then they will hold. So this is the best example of dysmetria. And this is past pointing. They are not exactly locating, but there is past pointing Okay, to the target. And there can also be intention tremors. Suppose uh, I ask a person to take... Uh, uh, a chart piece like this. So, suppose a person who is having an intentional tremor, whenever he is performing a known task, there can be generation of tremor. So, this is quite opposite from Parkinsonism, it is having the resting tremor. Even though when there is no activity, they will have a tremor. But here, whenever they are performing a task, initiation of the task, there can be uh, tremor. So, this is called as voluntary tremor or uh, intentional tremor. Okay. There can also be nystagmus, nystagmus, rotatory nystagmus or uh, so that is uh, uh, the eyeball movement will be there whether in the horizontal direction or vertical direction or in the rotatory direction. Three types of nystagmus we can see. So there is a repetitive rhythmic and rapid movement of the eyeballs. This is called as nystagmus. Cerebellar nystagmus, it is uh, 
very uh, difficult to manage also so they cannot even focus and all and uh, if you see uh, can you name any one physiological nystagmus that is called as optokinetic nystagmus for example when you are going in a moving train when you are focusing on a one particular object and the train is moving ahead that uh, time you can see and nystagmus that is called as optokinetic nystagmus which is physiological okay but here the cerebellar nystagmus is pathological next coming to the other one this called as uh, dysdiadecokinesia or adiadecokinesia so that is uh, inability to perform rapid rhythmic movements suppose uh, like alternate uh, pronation and supination alternate pronation and supination this is possible in case of normal persons but in case of cerebellar lesions there can be dysdiadecokinesia or adiadecokinesia this means inability uh, means uh, there is some slowness or difficulty in performing a means they cannot even perform the task a dialogo kanisha this is and if you see the speech they are having a scanning and slurred speech suppose there is one term called as british constitution they will not spell like this but instead they will spell like british uh, constitution like that they will uh, they will scan the speech this is called as scanning that is slurred and scanned speech which is typical characteristic feature of cerebellar disorders and if you see the gait it is like a drunken gait this called as drunken gait which is characteristic uh, uh, feature of cerebellar disorders is also called as staggered gait so these are all the uh, we have seen all the things like hypotonia atonia asthenia disequilibrium pass pointing intentional tremors nystagmus dystiadecokinesia or adiadecokinesia staggered gait or drunken gait and scanned and slurred speech these are all the typical characteristic feature in a person with cerebellar disorder so we have seen what are all the different parts of the cerebellum and about the functional divisions of the cerebellum and uh, what are the functions of the cerebellum disorders of the cerebellum before that to understand well about we have seen the connections between the different neurons in the cerebellar cortex and there what are all the efferents and different connections to the cerebellum via the inferior middle and the superior cerebellar peduncles so the cerebellum thus plays a very important role in control of uh, tone and uh, equilibrium and also in learning movements in case of voluntary and involuntary activities so along with the cooperation of uh, different parts of the cerebellum by its connections so thus uh, the cerebellum is very important for us so hope this session is useful for you and uh, we are completing the part of the cerebellum physiology of the cerebellum and please like this video and share this video to your friends thank you